All right, well, uh, some of you know that last week we started a new series uh, based on the letters of Jesus to the seven churches in Asia in Revelation 2 and 3. So last week was just like an introduction. We looked at chapter 1, and if you missed that, that's on YouTube. You can catch that on YouTube. Uh, But this week we're going to actually look at the first letter that Jesus wrote, and that was to the church at Ephesus. And uh, just a very quick background about the city of Ephesus at that time before we look at the church. Um, The city of Ephesus wasn't the capital in that in that province of Asia Minor, but it was the largest city. Pergamos was the the capital, but Ephesus was was a bustling city, a a city of great commerce, a prosperous, uh, a prosperous city. Uh, Probably two reasons for that. One, it had the biggest harbour, so lots of trade coming through into the city that way. And also the road uh, that went through Ephesus linked the east and the west, and it was called the gateway to Asia. So there's a lot of uh, trade and commerce being poured into the city, but also, sadly, many of the Christians who were martyred were brought through that road as well. And so it was also called by a guy called Ignatius, who was a church leader, the, uh, the, the gateway of the martyrs. Uh, so it's quite a, quite a prominent city in those days. But this church we know more about than any of the other churches, of uh, the, the seven churches. Why? Because, of course, we read about it in the book of Acts, Paul founded the church there. He planted the church there. He had revival there. And uh, incredible things were happening there. Um, Lots of people were getting saved. Lots of people were being baptised. We know that there was persecution because um, basically the the idol worship of Diana uh, was virtually overthrown. And so a lot of people went out of business because they made idols, they sold them. And when, they, when the people realised that they were just, you know, there's nothing in them, they renounced those things and lots, lots of people went out of business. So the Christians were persecuted a big time. But also, people realised that there was no power in the occult. A lot of people believed in the occult and satanic powers and so on, but they realised that the true, God, the true power was in the gospel and in Christ. And so they came and they burnt all their books and uh, uh, many people repented. There's a revival happening. Uh, there were miracles taking place in this city, uh, so much so that Paul couldn't keep up with it and, and he couldn't go in person and pray for people to be healed. So he just sent cloths or aprons or something like that and uh, laid them on the sick and those people were getting healed. So just imagine, uh, all this thing was happening in the city of Ephesus. In fact, Ephesus is the place where Paul stayed the longest in all his ministry. He stayed there for about three, three and a half years. Uh, That was very long for Paul because he was really an apostle that went from place to place. But so much was happening there that he put his roots down for a while. And in fact, uh, the Bible says this, that while he was there, the whole of Asia Minor heard the gospel. That's quite phenomenal. Um, so you can just get a picture of what was happening in this city. It was, it was revival as, as we would know it today. So that's exciting. And uh, of course, the church was blessed with many good teachers like Paul. Uh, Timothy also spent a while there and, and was a teacher there. Apollos taught there. And then, then as we saw last week, John spent some time there and, and ministered in that church. So it was quite a, quite a, you know, quite a, um, a great city in that sense. A lot of things were happening there. And it's the only, the only city in the whole of the New Testament that had two letters sent to it. Um, the first letter, of course, was written by Paul. And uh, many of us know that great epistle of uh, the Ephesians. And what a blessing that's been in our lives. But then, of course, there was this letter that was sent through John by Jesus to the church a generation later. And that's what we're going to look at uh, this morning. So let's just um, come to that for a moment. Ephesus had two epistles from two authors. Paul wrote to the saints, okay, the church. 
Whereas John wrote to the messenger. Now we looked at that word last week. It's from the, the word angel or agelos. And uh, it just simply means to tell or announce. So, so each letter was sent to a messenger, the one that would, like I'm doing today, stand before the congregation and give them the message that Jesus sent to that church. Now, some people say, see, um, the churches were led by pastors, by, by, by one man, the messenger. They, they use that as an argument, but, but that's not what it's saying. Only one person can get up here at a time and talk to you, isn't that right? So Jesus was giving this message to the person that was bringing the message to the church. In fact, if you look in uh, the Acts of the Apostles, when, when Paul wanted to call the leadership of that church together, he didn't send for the senior pastor. Who did he send for? The elders, plural, of the church. And he spoke to them. And so um, we see that churches were led by a plurality of elders, not by one single person. But John wrote, or Jesus wrote through John to this church, and this is what he said, to the angel or the messenger of the church of Ephesus, write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the golden lampstands, just quickly refresh what we said, the seven stars are the, the, the messengers, the lampstands are the churches, okay? I know your works your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. So first of all, this church was commended. Jesus had a lot of things to commend them for. They were a, just a strong church that were doing so much for Jesus, okay? Uh, they were commended for their works. Now, we've seen that this, this church was really involved in ministry, but also for their labor. In other words, the, the effort they put into those works. They worked hard for Jesus, okay? Their patience in suffering. Probably they were still being persecuted because they confronted um, idolatry and, and, and the occultism and so on. They stood firm in that and they were, they were suffering persecution, but they stood firm and patient in their suffering. But also their doctrinal soundness. They tested those who said they were apostles and were not. Now, because this city uh, had a lot of visitors, people coming and going and passing through, there were a lot of people that would come and announce themselves as apostles that had just turned up. And, and so, you know, wanting the church to give them room, to give them the pulpit. But they tested those who said they were apostles. I like that. I really like that because, you know, we don't just let anybody into the pulpit to say anything they want. I wonder how they tested those who said they were apostles. I know how I would test them. I would test them this way. You see, an apostle, the Bible says that the church is built on the foundation of the apostles. They, they laid the foundation of the church for people to build their lives on, for people to build churches on. What was that foundation? Jesus Christ. No other foundation can anyone lay except that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. You can't go beyond him, but you can go deeper into him. And the apostles had a revelation of the person and the ministry of Jesus. You know what I would do? I would sit them down for, and say, okay, you say you're an apostle. Just share with me. I've got an hour. Share with me what you're going to share with the church. And if it's not about Jesus, the door is over there. <laughs> Amen? Amen? They tested them. I like that. They didn't just let anybody into the pulpit because we're not here to let anybody have a go and just say whatever they want. We, we're here to proclaim Jesus. He's our message and he's the one that we focus on. They tested those who said they were apostles and they were not. You know, remember when Paul called the elders together, he said this, I know this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. I reckon they remembered that. Also, he said, from among yourselves, men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples unto themselves. Therefore, watch 
and remember that for three years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. Sadly, this happens. Satan gets in amongst the flocks. He sends people in to draw people away, not unto Jesus, but unto themselves. To make disciples unto themselves. To, to devastate and decimate the church, the flock, to scatter the flock. And so that's why they were very vigilant. They stood firm against anyone that would come in and, and want any kind of influence over the people. And they tested those who said they were apostles and found them not. And he says also, you have, uh, this you have. This is another thing I commend you for. He says that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Something Jesus hated. The deeds of the Nicolaitans. What, what, what are the deeds of the Nicolaitans? We're going to look at that later on. It comes up in, in one of the other churches. I think it's the church at Pergamos. But uh, basically the word... It's made up of two words in the Greek. Nikeo is to conquer. You know, uh, the sports brand Nike. Nike. That's what it means. And in fact, it's interesting that they, that probably their most uh, popular product is the shoe, isn't it? The, the sports shoe, Nike. And uh, in those days, when, when a king conquered another king, he would put his foot on the neck of that king to say that he's conquered that king. And... and uh, th that's what Nikeo means, to conquer. And laos, from which we get the word laity, the people. To conquer the people. So, so the, the Nicolaitans in some way conquered the people. We'll look at that in a bit more detail, otherwise we're going to go off on a track. But what it says there is, I, I like this about you, that you hate the, the, the deeds of the Nicolaitans. You know, the other church, it says, you, you have there those who you tolerate. The Nicolaitans. So, so in that church, they'd come in amongst them and had influence. But this church, you can just see, uh, the church at Ephesus, they were strong. They tested those who said they were apostles and were not and sent them packing. They hated the deeds of the Nicolaitans. They, they didn't get a foot in the door either. And so they were protective over the flock. Can you get a picture of this church? It was a good, strong, healthy church that was really doing much for Jesus. But Jesus had one thing against this church, and we're going to look at that this morning. You see, a lot of people say, um, in fact, let's look at it first of all. He says, nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Now, you know what a lot of, um, a lot of teachers say when they, they preach on this verse? To leave your first love is, in other words, they're not doing so much for Jesus. <laughs> I reckon this church was doing a lot for Jesus. That wasn't the issue at all, friends. It wasn't that they were slack or lazy. Uh, they weren't backslidden, apathetic or devoid of good works. We've just seen all the things that he commended them for. So what was the problem? They'd left their first love. What does that mean? The word left, first of all, is the, for the Greek word aphiemi, which is a strong word in the Greek which means to leave alone or to, to abandon, really, to depart from or, or forsake. We see that word being used, for example, when Jesus called the disciples. And the Bible says they left their nets and followed him. They, they forsook them. They abandoned them and followed Jesus. Now, you, you try to bring that into this verse that we're looking at. They left their first love. They've, they've gone away from this first love. That they had. Okay, so also that word is used uh, regarding the, the woman at the well. When Jesus ministered to her after a while, the Bible says she left her water pot and went into the, the town and told the people about Jesus. So she forsook that, she left that behind. That's the meaning. Now, Jesus said, Look, I've got all this that I really appreciate about you. I commend you for all these works that you do, but there's one thing I've got against you. You've left your first love. What does that mean? What does that mean? Let's look on. The word first is the word protos. And it means first in order or foremost in time. That which was first in the beginning. That which you had at the beginning. That's the meaning. Okay. The same word is used in the next verse where it says, remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first Protoss works, the, the works that you did in the beginning. Now, they were already doing these works. So it's not actually talking about the works themselves, but the way in which 
they did it. The motive for which they did those things. Let's look at this for a moment. Uh, what characterised our first work? I can only speak for me. You know, when I first got saved, um, nobody had to motivate me or guilt trip me or threaten me in order to get me to come to church or do anything for Jesus. Nobody had to do that. And I'm sure it was the same with you. You know, I was so in love with Jesus. When I heard of what Jesus had done for me at the cross, how he laid down his life for me, I thought, somebody loves me that much? I've never met anybody that loves me that much. And, and I, I just couldn't do enough for him out of gratitude. Nothing else, just out of pure gratitude. You know, I was 18, 19, 18 or 19, when I, before our morning service, okay, I used to not just teach at a Sunday school, I used to run a Sunday school and had a lot of people under me at that age, 18 or 19, people, ladies are old enough to be my mother, my grandmother, they used to run this Sunday school. Then we go to church, like we are here now. I've already done a Sunday school before you guys rocked up. And then after church, we go home for lunch. Then I taught at a branch Sunday school. Then we come back at night for the night meeting. And then some of us still didn't want to go home. So we had a Bible study every week and we got home late and had to get up for work the next day at monday i used to run a boys club lead a boys group tuesday we had the prayer meeting wednesday was the youth group thursday was bible study and i was really really sad because i couldn't go to the bible study because i had to spend time preparing for my sunday school and then friday we had a coffee bar outreach Saturday, there's always something on, like a joint meeting with other churches. Or so. Nobody had to say, come on, go to church. I'd go to any meeting that I could go to. I'd even rock up at the elders' meeting if they'd let me in. <laughs> it's a meeting, isn't it? Yeah, but you can't come. <laughs> I just love the Lord because he loved me so much. That, that's, this is first love. Nobody had to threaten me or, 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 or kind of um, uh, bribe me to do something for Jesus. My love for him was a response to his love for me. Amen? And the first love that the Ephesians had, that was how they loved Jesus. They did it because he loved them so much. And we're going to actually read one of the prayers that Paul wrote to the Ephesians to teach them how to pray. And that's what it was all about. In fact, we'll come to that in just a moment. But let's just read this for a moment. What Jesus, sorry, what John said in his first epistle. He said, in this the love of God was manifested towards us, that God has sent his only begotten son into the world, that we might live through him. That's how God manifested his love to us. That's the epitome. That's the greatness of it. This is it. Amen. That's why we read on, let's read on a minute. In this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That, that, that word propitiation means the one who bore the wrath of God, the judgment of God, the anger of God against us, it fell upon him. In this is love. Any definition that you have of the love of God that does not include that, I would suggest to you is defective. In this is love. Greater love has no man than this, that a man would lay down his life for his friends. God did that for us. Jesus did that for us. And that is overwhelming. It's just, it just blows us away. And it causes us to be so in love with him that we just want to thank him and love him. And, and whatever we do is out of gratitude. Amen. It goes on to say, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. We love him because he first loved us. Amen? So we love not in order to get God to love us, but because he does love us. Amen? They had fallen into the trap of mercenary love or giving to get, loving to be loved. 
And isn't that what happens in religion? We're just saying about, you know, we're finished with the religion, we're finished with tradition. This is what we're talking about. This is what religion does. If you do this for God, he will do this for you. That's religion, friends. Pure Christianity is, this is what God has done for you. I'll leave that with you. Let the Holy Spirit work in your heart. You cannot help but love him who loves you so much. Amen? You don't need to be threatened. <laughs> you don't need to be bribed. I mean, can you just imagine that in marriage? You know, like, that's how it was in marriage. You fall in love with one another. But sadly, in some marriages, it, it becomes this trade-off with one another. If you do this for me, I'll do this for you. Can you just imagine how that would be in, 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 in a marriage, you know, like, um, hey, you know, if you do this for me and do this for me, then I'll do this for you. Has it come to that? That's how marriages break down, isn't it? It's gone quiet, isn't it, in here? <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you're all, all in love with each other and all happy. Praise God. But that's what happened in this church. Something happened, whether it came in through the pulpit or some teaching, this is what Christianity became. A giving to get, a loving to be loved. It turned the whole thing around and stripped it of its glory and its grace and its beauty and its majesty that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I'll leave it to you, he says. You see how you want to respond to that. Amen? There's no conditions to that. There's no price to pay. It's just the pure, unadulterated love of God. First love is the fruit of the revelation of his love to us. This is this great prayer. I reckon this is the greatest prayer you could ever pray. It's the greatest prayer in the Bible. And um, it, it, it was written to the Ephesians, to the church at Ephesus. Isn't that interesting? Uh, I think before that, Paul says something like, um, um, uh, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he would, you would be strengthened by might, by his spirit in your inner man, okay, God wants you to be strong, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now, Jesus dwells in our spirit, every one of us, our spirit is joined to him. But you know that the heart is, everything flows out of the heart, amen? And, and sometimes Jesus is not in our hearts. He, he doesn't dwell in our hearts. You know, our hearts are full of this world. Our hearts are full of maybe covetousness. Our hearts might be full of lust or pride or some other thing or, or, or even some ambition. Um, it, you know, even unforgiveness and bitterness. Some people's hearts get filled with all sorts. That's why Paul, uh, the Bible says, keep your heart with all diligence because out of it flow the issues of life. This is why Paul is praying that the Jesus who dwells in your spirit would dwell in your hearts. Dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and the length and the depth and the height to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge. <laughs> Isn't that great? Amen? That you be rooted and grounded in love and that we can comprehend with all the saints. You know, you will never, never know the depth, the height, the width, the breadth of God's love in isolation. You'll only know it with all the saints. This is the wonderful thing. See, it talks there about the love of God which passes knowledge. We're not talking about a love which you can understand by learning that's possible. You can understand the, the love of God by learning, by re even reading the Bible. You can understand. But this is an experiential love. As we journey together, I might have been a Christian for 50 years. You might have been a Christian for five months. I can learn from you as I see the love of God working in your life, as you, as you testify what God has done in your life. I stand there gobsmacked of the love of God, beholding God's love poured out in this one and this one and this one, knowing that you're going through a, a difficult time, but God is faithful to you. I'm walking you know, through this with you. And I get strengthened and encouraged. I behold the love of God in you. That's why 
You'll never know it fully in isolation. Amen? Amen. To know the love of God which passes knowledge. And then it finishes with this, this amazing phrase, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Wow. <laughs> Explain that, somebody, please. That you may be filled with all the fullness of God. You go, uh, impossible. That's why, you know what he says after that? Now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we can ask or think of him. Amen. Yeah, impossible, you think, but God, with God all things are possible. That you might be filled with all the fullness of God. How? By abiding in his love, being rooted in his love and journeying with the saints of God, sharing the love of God together. Amen. Now, when the Bible speaks about the root of his love, this is very important. It's his love to us, not our love to him. When the Bible speaks about the fruit of love, that's our love to him, the response. Amen. The problem is religion always gets us to focus on the fruit. God wants us to focus on the root. If you focus on the root, guess what you see? The fruit. The, the fruit comes from the root. And if we're rooted in his love, eventually the fruit of the spirit is love joy, peace, and so on. So the Bible speaks about the being rooted in his love. As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. In, in the parable of the sower, uh, he who received the seed on the stony places, this is he who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself but endures only for a while when tri tribulation or persecution arises because of the word immediately he stumbles see this is the whole thing a lot of people can can be involved with religion with church life and so on come along do all the things but if they're not rooted in jesus the day of reckoning will come there'll be a day of testing and they'll fall away but if you're rooted in the love of god You'll come through all things because it's his love that keeps us, praise God. Now, when the Bible speaks about the root of love, then it's his love to us. Example of that is comparing Peter and John at, at the stage that we see them in, in the Bible, especially a, a classic example is in John chapter 13, which we, we're not going to look at, but I, you can look at it when you go home. In that chapter, Peter has a lot to say. And sometimes we can listen to someone who's got a lot to say and we think, wow, they're really spiritual. They're dominating the conversation. They're, they're confident. They're sure of themselves. You know, actually, if you look at, and somebody's done this, look at all the lives of the disciples and, and look at what they said as recorded in the Gospels, add up word for word everything that every disciple said. Peter said more than the 11 disciples put together. You say, I know someone like that. Well, that's, you get it. <laughs> that's a fact. And you can get impressed with that, right? John, in John chapter 13, he didn't say anything except for one thing, and that's what Peter asked him. <laughs> Peter asked him, when, Jesus, when, when John, uh, Jesus said that someone was going to betray him, Peter said to John, ask him who it is. That's the only time that John spoke, when Peter asked him to say something. And you can say, oh, John's quiet, isn't he? You know, the difference between Peter and John is this. John, in fact, we'll go back a bit. John only has one thing to say, that's because Peter asked him to say. But John refers to, him, to himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's so beautiful, isn't it? It's not he's saying, I'm his favorite. It, that's not what he's saying at all. Not at all. He's saying, I know it. I know it. I've got it. I know he loves me. Peter did not know it at that stage. He thought he had to earn it. That's why he's always speaking, always being the first to be everything and everywhere. Peter built his relationship with Jesus on the fruit of 
of his love to Jesus, not the root of Jesus' love to him. Now, when it come to the crunch, who was the only disciple left standing at the cross? John, the disciple whom Jesus loved. The one who knew he was loved by Jesus. That's what's going to get you there. That's what's going to keep you there, friends. Standing through all the storms of life, whatever happens, I know he loves me. I don't understand what's going on. I don't understand why this is happening, but I know he loves me. That's all I need to know. John remained at the cross. Peter didn't. John knew he was loved. Peter thought he had to perform to be loved. He was building on a wrong foundation. A crash was inevitable. And Jesus foretold this was coming. Simon, Simon, Satan has desire to have you that he may sift you as weak. But I pray for you that your faith will not fail. He needed to hear that. He was getting a glimpse of just how much Jesus loved him unconditionally. Jesus allowed his house to fall so that he could rebuild it on a firm foundation. We know what happened. Don't, go, don't need to go through the denial and all that because we know it so well. But what I do want to do is just quickly take you through the way Jesus restored him. Remember when he rose again? And he said to Mary, go and tell my disciples and Peter that I'll meet up with them in Galilee. Make sure you tell Peter. Why? Why? Because Peter thought he was no longer a disciple. He, he thought that his denial had disqualified him. He'd even gone back to fishing and was influencing others to do the same. So Jesus said, go and tell my disciples and Peter. And you know what happened? Jesus arranged that situation so beautifully. They were out fishing, just like when he first called them. They caught nothing. He came along. They didn't recognize him because his bodily appearance was different after the resurrection. He said, have you caught anything? They said, no. He said, cast your nets on the other side. And they caught this incredible amount of fish that they could not contain it. And Peter said, it's the Lord. And he jumped out of the boat to go to Jesus. And when they all got to shore, I love this part about it. He was already cooking breakfast. He caught the fish. I don't know how we could, but he caught the fish. He was caught in, cooking breakfast. But here's the thing. He arranged that situation because you remember when Peter denied Jesus? Where was it? It was around a coal fire, a charcoal fire. It was freezing there. He was warming himself. Just imagine, every time after that, Peter saw a charcoal fire flashback. That horrible moment when I denied with oaths and cursing that I even knew Jesus. So Jesus brings him around this coal fire where, where the, fush, the fish sorry, is, is cooking. And he said, Peter, do you love me more than these? You said you did. You said they would deny you, but... You never would. Do you love me more than this? This is what you are building your life on. This competitive love. This love that's better than theirs. As if I asked you to be better than them. Jesus never compares us, by the way. Satan will get us to compare ourselves with one another. Don't do it, friends. That's his trap. Jesus will never compare you with anyone else. He's not like that, you know, bad father that says... Why don't you be like your brother? <laughs> He's not like that. So we don't have to make that comparison. So Peter's standing there around the fire and Jesus is asking, do you love me more than these? He's dismantling these 40 foundations. He said, Lord, you know. You know the situation. I'm not going to go through it all. In the end, he said, do you love me more than these? And Peter says this, Lord, you know all things. I thought I knew I did, but I, I obviously don't. I don't even know myself, but you know all things. And Jesus recommissioned him three times. Three times he denied him. Three times he recommissioned him. Peter publicly denied him. Jesus publicly reinstated him to show him how much he loved him. And when you read the Acts of the Apostles, Peter dominates the first 12 chapters 
he spearheads what's happening in the early church. Why? He finally got it. My love for Jesus is not the foundation of my relationship with him. It's his love for me. And my love for Jesus is my response to his love for me. We leave the foundation of grace whenever we seek to build on the strength of our love and our works. That's religion. That's what the church has done over. It's interesting that this is the first exhortation in, in uh, the seven churches. This is the message that Jesus wanted to bring to the first church because this is religion, friends. This is what religion has done. This is what church history has done. Taken the focus on the grace of God, his unmerited, unconditional favour towards us and turned it around and made it as if we've got to earn something and do something and prove something to Jesus before he will love us and accept us. I get so angry. I, I hear it more and more. I see it on, on Facebook. All this conditional Christianity. You know, people trying to scare Christians by bringing out passages out of their context and, and use them to keep Christians in line. It has the opposite effect, actually. It's the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. You know how much God loves you. You can't help but respond in love to him. Amen. So when we do this, we, let's just read that. For, uh, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of your works, not of yourself, sorry. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Notice the order. We're not saved by our works. We're not working towards God's favour by our works. We come by grace. And then we discover those good works that he's prepared for us and we walk in them. Amen? When we do this, we turn Christianity into a religion. That's when we get it back to front. And our works become uh, a means to, our, to an end. Mercenary works. You know, this whole thing of like, you sow a seed to get a blessing. You want God to bless you? You sow a seed. Same thing. Well, you know, you know the message that sends? It sends a message... You know what, God, God doesn't really love you, but he can be bribed. <laughs> He's not really a good God, but how much you got? How crazy is that, friends? You know, God is a good God. You want to give to God? Give out of, of a, a heart full of grace, an overflowing heart. Not because you think you can get something by doing that. That's a wicked message, I reckon. Authentic Christianity is where faith works through love. Paul said that in Galatians chapter 5. Faith works through love. How, do you, how can you trust in God until you know that God loves you? How can you trust someone who you think is going to hurt you or hasn't got your best interest at heart? How can you trust someone like that? Faith works through love. Romans, I think, is the greatest epistle. It's what changed my life. And, and Paul spends eight chapters unpacking the whole doctrine of salvation. It just is so amazing. It's mind-boggling. It's life-changing. Then he spends three chapters talking about Israel because people conclude, well, what about Israel? Has God forsaken them? No, God hasn't forsaken any of his people. God has a wonderful plan for Israel. Then he comes to the application in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. I beseech you, therefore, that's on the basis of everything I've said before about what God has done for us. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Some people look at that and they say, well, see, service. So we've got to be servants. We're not servants, we're sons. Of course we're sons. That's our status. But we're sons who enjoy the privilege of serving God. It's different, isn't it? Amen. It's a reasonable response. In fact, um, Often the Bible speaks, and a lot of the leaders in the church speak of themselves as being the servants of God. But they use an, a, a, a special term, a bond servant. You ever notice that? Now there's a difference between a servant and a bond servant. A servant says, I serve my master. A bond servant says, 
I love my master. He serves because he loves. You see, in the Old Testament, under the, under the law, this, is, this term was used because um, if, if, if an Israelite fell into hard times and he had to sell his property, his inheritance, even himself as a slave to a fellow Jew, he could only do that for a certain period of time, seven years. In the seventh year, he had to be released and everything had to be given back to him that was taken. But you know what sometimes happened? That servant would say at the end, you know, the master would say, okay, you're free to go now. And he would say, you know what? I love my master. He has treated me so well. I don't know where I could go, where I, I, I'd be better off than what I am now. I love my master. I want to stay with him. I want to serve him for the rest of my life out of love because he loves me, he cares for me, he's treated me so well. I want to stay with him. And that's a bond servant. They would, they would drill his ear through in a certain way and mark him to say that he was now a bond servant. He bound himself over to his master out of love to serve him all his days. Isn't that beautiful? Nothing, nothing um, mandatory about it. There was nothing that they had to do that. He was free to go. But he said, I don't want to go. I don't want to go and just be a law unto myself. I, just, I don't want to leave my master. I want to serve him. And throughout the New Testament, the word bondservant is applied to someone absolutely devoted to Jesus because of love. No other reason. Because of love. Paul Timothy, James, Peter and Jude all describe themselves as bondservants of Christ. So this is what Jesus was saying to the church. That's how it was in the beginning. Everything you did was an overflow of the love of God. How did you have that love? Because you understood my love for you. The more we immerse ourselves in the love of God, the more we love him. We love him because he first loved us. So, the exhortation in this verse, this last verse that we're going to look at, Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, Remember therefore from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Remember, that's actually a, a, a present active verb. In the Greek, a present active verb. It means to keep on remembering. Don't we need to keep on being reminded of what I'm sharing with you? Amen, we do. We get so much religion bombarding us, so much of this conditionalism that comes to us, this, this mercenary kind of Christian living. We have to constantly be reminded, no, it's not like that. It's because he loves me. I want to I just dwell in his love. And then everything will flow out of that. To be mindful of or even fix the mind upon. John Bunyan in his book Grace Abounding said, It is profitable to all Christians to be often calling to mind the very beginnings of grace. The first love, in other words, the first love. Go back and remember how it was. When I remember my early days as a Christian, nobody had to had to kind of stir me up. I mean, my, my dad said to me, when I became a Christian, I was going down to the church, he said, you won't keep that up. Just like everything else you've done, you won't keep that up. Three months later, he said to me, you'll be taking your bed down there soon. <laughs> I thought, that's a good one. You never thought about that. I'll have a chat with the pastor, see if that's possible. <laughs> that's how it was. Was that how it was with you in the beginning? You heard so much of the gospel of Jesus, the, the cross of Jesus, his death upon the cross for you. You think, how could someone love me that much? I love him in response. Keep on reminding yourself. Repent, as we know, just simply means to change one's mind. That's why we sing that song, I'm coming back to the heart of worship because it's all about you. It's all about you. They didn't, see, they didn't lose their first love. They left it. And so they, they returned to it. They said, yeah, this is what it's about. I'm sorry, Lord, for the, the things I've made it when it's all about you. And do the first works. Grace doesn't stop us doing, friends. 
It just corrects our motive for doing so. Amen? Amen. Jesus said, if you don't repent, I'll remove your, your lamps. And you know what that says to me? He says, I don't want that brand of Christianity. I don't want people to represent me in this mercenary way. That, you know, you've, you've got to pay a price to him for him to do something for you, to love you. And you've got, to, you've got to keep in line for him to keep his love constant towards you. He loves you because, not because you're good, but because he's good. Amen. That will never change. He cannot change who he is. With him there is no variableness or shadow of term. He, God is love. And he poured out his love on the cross for you and I. And, and he said, that's how much I love you. That will never change. Keep coming back to that. Keep meditating upon the love of Jesus and the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And remember that he did it all for us. Amen. I don't know if you've left your first love. But if you have, Jesus is calling you back to that first love. Fall in love with him again. How do you do that? Just see how much he loves you. Just read the word of God. Meditate upon his love for you. It'll come. That, that, that beautiful spring of life will begin to bubble up again and, and flow over your, uh, out of your heart towards him and towards others. Let's pray together. Father, we just thank you for your amazing love. Oh Lord, we, we do just want to be rooted in that love. We want to discover with all the saints, our brothers and sisters, the length and the breadth the depth and the height, to, to bathe in that love, that we might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we can ask or think according to his power that works in us. Through Jesus Christ, we say, let it be in each of our hearts and lives. Amen. Amen.